It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. That's Professor Zach Hartwig. I think a lot of you know Zach, but maybe not everybody. So I thought I'd provide a little bit of background. He, Zach got his PhD from MIT, the uh, Nuclear Science and Engineering Program uh, uh, Department, where he did some very interesting work that is quite different than what he's working on now. Um, uh, he, he built and tested a very novel and interesting new diagnostic for interrogating the first wall in a tokamak. It used a energetic ion beam steered by the magnets in the tokamak uh, to hit different places on the wall and um, uh, determine the characteristics of the, of the first wall, you know, the deposits, uh, uh, erosion and such. Uh, and it had the advantage that it was in situ and so he could make measurements uh, between runs or even between shots. Now, up until that point, the only kind of measurements available were ex situ, where we would take first wall material out of the tokamak between campaigns, where you got basically one measurement per year and, and the conditions you were looking at were averaged over an entire years of experiment. So big improvement there. Um, after uh, graduation, he worked as a postdoc for a while and then accepted an appointment to the NSC faculty. Um, Zach was part of the original Spark Skunk Works back when it wasn't a multi-billion dollar company, but just a few people kicking around ideas and then was one of the co-founders of CFS itself. And once the project really got rolling, uh, he led the R&D team, which worked on uh, high temperature superconductor cables and magnets. Uh, and that all led to the successful test of a toroidal field model coil just a few months ago in the fall of 21. So today he's going to talk about those efforts and some of the results. Zach? Terrific. Thanks for the introduction, Martin. I'm sort of reminded this is our second go round at IAP. We did this about five years ago now. Um, so, okay, welcome everybody. Um, we have a pretty ambitious agenda for today, so I'm going to try to, to get through it on time. What we're going to talk about today is what I sort of call the long road uh, to 20 Tesla on the Spark toroidal field uh, model coil. And it's, it's sort of really a, a magnet origin story. It's to provide a little bit of the maybe sort of excitement and color um, sort of behind the magnet project uh, to help us better put the magnet uh, in context. So you can see the magnet, you can see the test facility that we built at MIT to test it uh, here on the screen. Uh, we're going to dive into that in more detail. So I want to you know, acknowledge all the people uh, listed here at the bottom who provided uh, material for this talk, uh, a sort of an enormous outpouring uh, of information. So I want to start uh, in sort of the place I think which is most important uh, to doing big projects, and that's to acknowledge the people uh, who make projects happen. That's really something that I came to learn uh, firsthand over the four or five years of leading projects here is that people make projects. So I want to thank the exceptional, exceptional team. Uh, from Commonwealth Fusion Systems and from MIT. You can see a number of their faces here uh, in the test hall uh, who delivered on the TFMC project uh, through some pretty extraordinary circumstances, uh, as you can tell by everybody uh, wearing face masks uh, for about 15 months uh, of this project. So, you know, I, I try to list uh, everybody here, um, you know, who had an important hand in this project. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I missed a few people. I don't have time to go through everybody. I do want to acknowledge uh, a few people, Rui Vieira, the chief engineer, uh, and then the engineering group leaders, Brian LaBombard, Chris Lamy, Joy Dunn, Ted Golfinopoulos, uh, and Phil Michael. A number of other people, you know, just terrific effort. Also want to acknowledge our vendors uh, who delivered under some pretty extraordinary circumstances. Uh, you know, again through through a couple tough years uh, for them. So, you know, great group uh, of people, many of whom are going to be involved in a lot of the things you hear about uh, today. So, I want to also just acknowledge that the TFMC project and the success that we'll talk about. Uh, is a pretty nice confirmation of a hypothesis that we kind of put forth about five or six years ago, which was the idea that we could develop a new model for collaborative research where, you know, we would combine the best uh, of academia uh, with new companies, with a startup. So we could actually start a company like CFS, grow it alongside of the, the R&D that was going on. 
uh, to the point that where it would be capable of taking the research out of MIT and yeah. commercializing it. And so, you know, this uh, sort of partnership of, of CFS and PSFC that was proposed uh, some years ago, you know, really came to fruition in this project. So a really nice, uh, a nice thing to recognize. So let's talk about the Spark toroidal field model quill project, which I'll refer to as TFMC uh, in, in most of this talk. And for the purposes here, I'll sort of characterize it as doing four things. Um, the first was really to develop the basic uh, conductor technologies uh, that we needed to build magnets. You can see a picture of two of them that we developed on the left, cables and coils. Um, and then taking those technologies, we had to design and build the model coil itself. You can see a picture of that here being rigged uh, by a team at MIT. We had to then in parallel build and commission a test facility to actually go off and characterize the magnet. And then we had to actually run the test. So we wanted in our first test to get to 20 Tesla. It's about 15 to 20 times more powerful than a hospital MRI, which is sort of the magnets some of us might be familiar with uh, in everyday life. Uh, and we wanted to achieve 20 Tesla in our first test. And we did that. So this project, uh, which was pretty ambitious, was completed in four years or so by MIT and CFS in partnership uh, with our vendors. And when I had a chance to sort of think about giving this talk, um, I sort of wanted to step back a little bit and, and sort of think, you know, that was a pretty impressive run that, that we had uh, over a pretty difficult period of time. And so it sort of begs the question, you know, how does this project compare to other things uh, that may have been done in a similar vein? Um, and I list one here. This is called the Eater Central Solenoid Model Coil. So it's another type of magnet that was built as an experiment. You can see a picture of it here. Um, you know, how does this compare to what we did uh, over the last few years? So in terms of the project scope, it was roughly the same uh, as TFMC, the idea of building a large coil, representative scale, testing it, et cetera. Um, the coil itself, as you can see here, is quite a bit larger due to the technology uh, that they had at the time, a little bit more stored energy, but it's about the same electrical current. And it's actually, you know, almost half, uh, a little more than half of the magnetic field, which makes some of the challenges a little easier. It took about a decade uh, to develop this project. We might sort of say two years to develop the conductor technology, eight years to design, fabricate, and test the coil. Um, and perhaps most striking in contrast, if you look at the participants, uh, I list some of them here. You know, this was a dozen plus major industries across three continents. You know, you'll see names like Lockheed Martin, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, and Saldo, uh, a, a large Italian contractor. So there's a lot of work around the world uh, with a test site in Japan. And so, you know, when I kind of had a chance to reflect on our own uh, accomplishments here, you know, it sort of raised a question, which was while our coil was much smaller, you know, we, along with our vendors, executed a similar project scope in less than half of the time, including 15 months with COVID-19 restrictions, with almost everything, with an exception of large-scale machining and forging and some component fabrication, you know, really done in-house here. And, you know, like the CSMC project that you see here, it worked on the first uh, time out of the gate. And it sort of begs the question, how? So that's what we want to talk about in part for this talk today. So what I want to do, we'll lay out the agenda here is a little ambitious. Uh, as I said, I want to try to go uh, beyond sort of asking the what question, what is TFMC? And I want to try to get to the how and why. So I want to go a little level deeper, um, in, maybe deeper than that we typically tend to go in, in technical talks. So I want to ask some questions like, how did we get to the TFMC and through it? You know, why was this magnet project successful uh, and on such a challenging schedule? And you know, why did this project happen? Uh, so why did it come out of MIT uh, and done here with MIT and our partner CFS? Why did it happen here and not somewhere else? So in order to do all that, um, what I wanna do is convince you of three things uh, in this talk. So I wanna convince you first that high field superconducting magnets enable a better path to fusion energy. That's why we're doing them. Uh, I wanna sort of make a sort of hypothesis uh, that we can test in this talk, which is that there are sort of three key attributes that go some ways to answering this how and why question. Um, and I list them here, we'll talk about them in a second. And then after we kind of look at how it was possible and why it happened here, then I want to convince you that high field superconducting magnet technology is approaching uh, maturity uh, with the test successful build and test of a model coil. So to do this, you know, here's our agenda. We're going to look very briefly uh, at magnets and magnetic fields and fusion energy. We don't have too much time. 
Then what I'd like to do is trace what I have sort of come to appreciate as the 100 year odyssey of high field magnet R&D at MIT that led us right up to the TFMC and enabled us to execute the project in part. Uh, and then we'll get an overview of the TFMC project uh, and what its success might mean for fusion. So first I wanna sort of uh, take a look at these three terms which are gonna underline, uh, sort of play, sit in the background of a lot of what we're gonna talk about uh, in the middle of the talk. And it's the three things that I think are really important to look at when we sort of review this history and try to ask the questions, how did we do this? Why was it at MIT? Why was it successful? Um, the first thing I, I sort of think is important is sort of culture, culture of an organization and the project. And so you can kind of define that as the pattern of behavior ingrained in an organization that defines how it solves problems, includes beliefs, norms, values, mindsets that shape our actions. Um, culture is a very intangible thing. It's very difficult to communicate, especially in a talk. Um, and so you'll see a lot of it implicitly, I hope, uh, in what we talk about and what we see. But I thought uh, when I was, when I was uh, discussing with Joe Minervini, former head of PSSC Magnet Division about this talk, he gave me a great quote, which I think sort of puts you, uh, gives you a sense of what that culture is at MIT. And what he said was, uh, in keeping with MIT tradition, we tackle only the most difficult technical challenge in the field of magnets, you know, always pushing, always developing first of kind uh, new technologies. The second thing I want to talk about and, and try to uh, examine here is something I've come to call institutional capabilities. Um, and here I would sort of say this is the intrinsic ability uh, to move quickly and confidently and at scale. So this includes things like equipment, processes, you know, systems, you know, working knowledge uh, that's in place to get something done and we'll see that. Um, and the third, as I sort of said when I introduced the team and, and thanked everybody, it's, it's really about the people. So I would just sort of define that as the integrated experience, the expertise, and the efforts uh, of those people uh, who bring you know, all of their sort of selves uh, and put that into the project. And so we're going to try to see elements of all three of these things. Before we begin in earnest, I do want to just issue an apology in advance. Um, I can't possibly show everything that people sent me upon my request. It was an enormous deluge uh, of material, uh, which is terrific. We're, we're going to try to cover a lot of material and inaccuracies and omissions are inevitable. Um, and I do want to point out, this is just one perspective um, to, to look at this project and, and what came before. And it's a, a bit of a historical one at that. So we're going to spend a little more time looking at the history uh, rather than at some of the innovations in the TFMC uh, to sort of take a, a bit of a 10,000 foot view. And I do want to make a point here that I'm going to say MIT, um, that's often going to refer to a number of different laboratories uh, and centers that now operate as one as the Plasma Science and Fusion Center. So, you know, I list them here, Francis Bitter Magnet Laboratory, National Magnet Lab Laboratory, uh, Plasma Science and Fusion Center, and all the work that was done before those centers uh, came about. So with that, let's take a, a brief look at why we're interested in superconducting um, high field magnets for fusion. And so we'll do this as a series of primer lessons, if you like. So three lessons, which I'll state uh, and, and just quickly go through. The first is that we're interested in superconductors because we can make magnetic fields with very, very small power requirements. And you can see an example of that here. So this is the Alcator CMOD copper toroidal field magnet. So this is a magnet we operated here at MIT for about 25 years. You can get a sense of its scale. It's a copper magnet, it's not superconducting. Um, it produces magnetic fields of about 12 Tesla. The challenge is it only runs for about four seconds until it heats up because it's a resistive magnet um, and can melt. And in order to power, it takes about 225 megawatts for four seconds. You know, that's about the size of a small uh, power plant in a city. And you can see some of the enormous infrastructure, uh, rooms of equipment uh, that are required uh, to power that magnet that we had to, to operate and maintain at MIT. In contrast, the TFMC superconducting magnet, it's about the same scale. You look at the picture. It has a field that's about two times as high, which is good. We can operate it continuously for as long as we like. And it only takes about 120 kilowatts give or take. So that's about 2000 times less power just to operate that magnet. And if we were to put these magnets in a fusion power plant, you know, that significant savings in energy to run the magnet, we can actually sell as electricity onto the grid. So that's a good thing for a fusion power plant. The other point to make is that modern superconductors not only allow us to do all this great stuff with low power, but we can achieve much higher magnetic fields and in much smaller size devices 
uh, that we can otherwise. And I'll take an example from the world of cyclotrons. So this is a picture on the right of the 184 inch cyclotron that uh, Ernest Lawrence built at Berkeley in the mid 1940s. It's a copper magnet cyclotron and you can get a sense of the scale that's involved in this piece of equipment. So it made a beam of 100 MeV protons. It had a magnetic field of about two Tesla. And it had to weigh about 5,000 tons uh, to do what it needed to do because in large part of the magnetic field. At the bottom right, you can see where better superconductors take us, niobium-3 tin, in this case, for people who are interested. Um, this is a modern cyclotron for, for cancer therapies uh, that was designed and prototyped here at MIT. It has about the same beam characteristics, but it's a much higher magnetic field at 9 Tesla, and it's only 50 tons. So it's about 100 times less mass, which, if you know, depending on your scaling, that tends to mean about 100 times cheaper to build. So, you know, the same is true of fusion. When we can make something a hundred times smaller, it's effectively a hundred times cheaper, uh, faster, you know, easier to build. So that's a good thing. So that's why we like uh, superconductors. The second sort of primer lesson here is to make the point that fusion always maximizes the magnetic field that it can get out of magnet technologies that exist at the time. And that's simply because the performance of fusion gets better like magnetic field to the fourth, B to the fourth. And so you can see in this sort of graphical timeline, um, starting in the 50s and 60s, we had copper wire. So you can see Lyman Spitzer here with the first uh, stellarator at Princeton. Um, very low magnetic field. Then we took a step, a big step, in fact, up in magnetic field with something called cryogenic bitter plate magnets. We'll talk about those in a minute. We were able to get very, very high field, but again, at the expense of very high power consumption. So then what we did was we knew we had to take a hit uh, in field to get into the superconducting range of magnets, which we wanted for a fusion power plant. So while we went down in field in the next generation of fusion devices with niobium titanium magnets and then niobium 310 devices, um, we did get superconducting magnets, which are appropriate for fusion. Now what's happened in about the last 10 years is a new superconductor called rare earth barium copper oxide. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what it is, but it is essentially a transformational change in capabilities of superconductor. It is much, much better than anything that's happened uh, before from a magnetic field perspective and an engineering perspective. It has a lot of advantages. And so it's pretty clear from this timeline that at some point, somebody's gonna build a fusion machine out of the next greatest superconductor because it lets us go to much higher field. We get much higher performance in our fusion machine. And that leads us to the last lesson in this sort of uh, primer, which is that high field magnets uh, open a very attractive and accelerated path to fusion energy. Uh, and this is a path that was, you know, first really put forth by MIT maybe five or six years ago and is now being walked uh, by MIT and CFS. But it's also inspired, you know, quite a lot of others around the world uh, to see that this is an attractive path. Um, and, you know, where we were in about 2016 was finishing the operation of Alcator CMOD, our high field tokamak here, where we proved out that high field fusion science was a really viable and attractive option. We knew that if we could build high field magnets that got us, you know, 12 Tesla, 13 Tesla, 14 Tesla uh, magnetic fields in the center of the plasma of a tokamak, we could build very small devices that could put out hundreds of megawatts of fusion power and ultimately electricity um, very efficiently. But the sort of superconducting concepts we had at the time, high field superconductors, were kind of only at the drawing board or benchtop scale. There was really a gap between uh, what was needed and what was available. And that's basically what the toroidal field model coil project was. It was an idea to take what was sort of on the drawing board, we'll talk about that, um, do some of the developments necessary to build the electrical conductors to make the magnets, and then demonstrate that the magnets at a representative scale uh, we're really ready to go. So with that sort of quick tour of superconductors in high field in mind, I'd like to sort of turn to this idea of history um, and how sort of a hundred years of thinking about high field magnets at MIT was sort of able to lead us to the TFMC uh, and ultimately enable it. Um, and so in, you know, I, it's often been said that stories have a beginning and stories have an end. And I often find in technical talks, we, we tend to focus a lot on the end of the story, you know, the latest and greatest, the newest inventions, um, you know, the things that we did that enabled it to go. And we'll talk about those things. But what I also want to do here is sort of focus on the beginning and the middle of the story um, and look at the enormous foundation uh, that had to be in place for us to take those next steps and actually deliver on the toroidal field model coil project. 
So our story begins uh, perhaps in a, an unlikely place, which is in 1923 in a basement uh, in New York City. And the story begins as these stories often do uh, in academia with a young person uh, sort of desperately seeking to find a PhD project uh, that would pass muster. Um, this person, of course, is Francis Bitter, uh, as many of you know. He was born in 1900. Uh, he had a career uh, that only a physicist uh, sort of in the early part of the 20th century could have. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But what he's doing in 1920 is wondering what he's going to do for a PhD. And there's a great quote from his autobiography that says, As I was walking around the corridors of Columbia, my eye lit on an impressive looking magnet in an empty laboratory. And so, you know, it's always dicey to pinpoint the moment uh, where a chain of events, you know, starts, but this might be the moment, uh, you know, for our story here. Um, and so what Bitter does is he goes on to use that magnet, he completes his PhD, he measures the magnetic moment of, of noble gases. Um, but he, he's greatly disappointed and he's disappointed because the magnet technology at the time uh, does not allow him to go much above two to three Tesla. It's an iron-based magnet uh, that saturates. And so no matter what you do to it, you'll never get uh, you know, the higher fields that Bitter needed to do the atomic and nuclear physics uh, that he was interested in. So he goes on from here to have a, a pretty stunning career. Uh, like I said, you could only have in uh, sort of the early 20th century. He goes to Germany in the 1920s. Uh, he spends time with Planck, with Schrodinger. Uh, he makes friends with Leo Szilard uh, of nuclear weapons fame. Uh, he takes the subway home with Einstein and discusses the lectures at the time. He comes back from Germany to complete his PhD. He goes off to California, works for Robert Millikan, a Nobel Prize winning American physicist, um, and Hale, uh, the astronomer. Um, but all of the time he's doing this, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, you know, this problem of magnets needs to be solved. And so as he's thinking about what to do for a career, uh, he has this, this quote, which I pulled from his book. He says, one project that appealed to me was to make a stronger magnetic field that could be made with the iron-based magnets. The problem was to discover how far it was practical to go. And so that last part about how far it was practical to go really provides sort of the map and the vision that, that we're very much still walking on today. So what happens? So Bitter comes to MIT in the 1930s, and he starts to come up with concepts for how to build the first high field magnet. And he, he hits on one, which we'll see, but he has a problem. And the problem is, as we've seen, that copper magnets take an enormous amount of power to run because they're resistive. And MIT simply doesn't have the capabilities. So luckily, Bitter is at MIT, and he calls up Vannevar Bush, who's a titan, uh, sort of a early and mid 20th century science and technology. Vannevar Bush picks up the phone uh, and pulls a few strings at Con Edison, the local power company in Boston, and he hooks Bitter up uh, with a spot in the basement of the Scotia Street substation. Uh, and Bitter is able to have enough power to test his magnet. Now, I was sort of curious because this happened in Boston, and I was kind of curious to see uh, if this place still exists. And it turns out it does. And so, you know, you can go one and a half miles across the Charles River into Boston, and you can find uh, a very much turn of the 20th century uh, brick building right here on Scotia Street. Um, and it's in the basement of that building where the first high field magnet is ever tested. Um, and I think it's by no accident that, you know, 80 years later, uh, the TFMC is tested just a mile and a half away. Bitter really puts a pin down in the map and says that high field magnet technology is going to be developed at MIT. So ultimately what Bitter does is he invents something called the Bitter Plate Magnet. Um, and the idea here is to provide magnetic fields above three Tesla for science and engineering. So you can see uh, magnet number one uh, and then magnet number three, which was a more advanced design. Uh, and then ultimately here on the right, you can see a modern Bitter Plate Magnet. Now the way these work is pretty ingenious, uh, but very simple. So in terms of generating field, what he does is he stacks copper plates between insulators and he forces the current to take many turns uh, as it spirals around, which generates an axial magnetic field with no iron. But the real problem that turns out Bitter had to solve was how to remove all the heat from these magnets. And so he puts the magnets in a, a pressure vessel, essentially. He force flows water uh, around those magnets, but more importantly, through uh, the series of grooves that are in these plates. And that enables very high flux cooling um, of the copper, which is very hot. So in terms of what you know, ultimately this legacy does for TFMC, we have very high field, it can be done. 
the fundamentals of high field magnets are in place uh, and we know how to remove heat from magnets. Very nice. And what it turns out, you know, there's sort of an extraordinary comparison that we can make between Bitter's first high field magnet and the toroidal field model coil, despite the fact they're separated by almost 85 years. If you look at the sketch of magnet number one, what you'll see is Bitter puts several plates in a, to a spiral configuration that generates the magnetic field on axis. He puts that inside a pressure vessel and he force flows coolant around and through the plates of this magnet. If we look at the toroidal field model coil that we built here uh, in the last two years, it is exactly the same type of magnet. We have a number of plates that carry current in a spiral fashion. We put those plates together uh, to make a stronger magnetic field. And then we put that stack of plates into a pressure vessel, a case, and we force flow cooling around the magnet and through uh, special channels that we put into those pancakes. So in 1935, Bitter had essentially foreseen um, you know, the key elements of magnets and one that we would use uh, 85 years later, which is how to arrange the plates and how to keep them cold. Really an extraordinary uh, sort of visual comparison uh, here. So the next step uh, in our journey uh, is when a professor by the name of Bruno Copi comes to MIT. Uh, and Bruno Copi realizes that we could take bitter plate magnets, we could bend them, not to produce an axial field, but to produce a toroidal field. And we could confine a plasma uh, within those magnets. And so that leads to a series of devices, sort of known as the Alcator devices uh, here at MIT. So Alcator A, which had fields of around 12 Tesla on coil, Alcator C, 17 Tesla, and Alcator C mod, 12 Tesla uh, field on coil. All of these tokamaks used bitter plate magnet technology. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of learning that was done, you know, here at the PSFC because of this. So we learned um, not only about copper magnets, we learned about high field structural supports, um, how to forge, you know, with vendors uh, and machine large scale support systems, how to take good care of vacuum uh, and other things. And that, that experience translated directly to the TFMC. So, for example, we had to do our own forgings. Uh, and machinings. In this case, you see a forging of a, a very large structural case and pressure vessel uh, being done at our vendors, Ken Stevens uh, of the TFMC team there in the background. Um, you know, we had the in-house experience, the metallurgical uh, experts to call on, you know, who could uh, work directly with us on that process. The Alcator CMUD did a number of other things in the Alcator program. It left a whole lot of infrastructure around um, and a knowledge about how to use that infrastructure. So this is an example. Uh, this is a picture from May of 2018. This was the first time we carried out a soldering process uh, on anything that mattered early in the program. Um, and we actually used the oven uh, that was used to build uh, the, the CMOD TF coils. So it was really the expertise and the infrastructure that came from Alcator um, allowed us to do very quick uh, um, sort of at scale R&D for TFMC. Another aspect I wanted to touch on for Alcator was just simply the idea about large scale integration and operations of complex systems. So, you know, a number of people from MIT uh, involved. And, you know, you can kind of see some examples of what that looks like here. So the idea that we have experienced design engineers and modelers who understand the interfaces and how to put together enormously complex uh, systems. You know, other things like the installation and the operation of the 225 MVA alternator. Um, you can sort of see this was an alternator delivered by rail to MIT from Con Edison, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, sort of occurred to me putting this together, Con Edison may have done more for fusion and high field magnets than any other power company. Um, but they did donate this, which enabled us to power the Alcator CMOD uh, magnets. And then, of course, for 25 years, we had to assemble, maintain, and operate a, a world-class fusion facility. And, you know, these experiences were just enormously um, helpful to training a world-class team of students, scientists, engineers, technicians, et cetera. Um, and, you know, this was really driven home to me um, when I was at the Magnet Technology Conference. And Steve Gourlay, who's the former head of the U.S. Magnet uh, Development Program, gave a lessons learned talk, sort of his key lessons from a lifetime of building big magnets. Um, and one of the things he said which struck me was that critical steps in high field superconducting magnets dictate the need for high quality experienced technicians. And so, you know, many of our technicians uh, on the, the CMOD program, for example, or on the TFMC program, you know, came up through Alcator A, Alcator C, Alcator CMOD, and had a lifetime 
uh, of experiences that that made the TFMC possible. So a really nice touch point with with others in the field. And so I think you know in terms of the impact for TFMC, the is really a legacy, and it's that Alcatraz CMOD sort of gave us this culture of close and extra cooperation between students, scientists, engineers, technicians uh, on a complex. Okay, now I want to turn to a different magnet technology. Um, and this was the development of the first ever superconducting cables uh, for fusion magnets. So th this was led by a guy named Bruce Montgomery, uh, you know, Mitch Haining, Mike Steves, uh, other people at the PSFC starting in the 70s. Um, and so you can see a picture of what these things look like. This is basically a way to bundle many, many smaller superconductors together. Uh, such that you can carry the 50 to 100 kiloamps necessary for fusion magnets, but keep them cold and have enough structure uh, to support them. You know, th this idea came up in the mid 70s. Joe Minervini told me, you know, Bruce Montgomery took this uh, to the World Fusion Program in the 70s um, and was largely laughed, uh, sort of laughed out of the room that this was never a practical uh, way to do it. Um, and of course, you know, the last laugh was, was Bruce's ultimately. Um, because now CIC technology uh, underlines every single fusion, superconducting fusion magnet, um, with a few exceptions that have ever been built uh, in the world. So this was really a big foundation uh, for the next step in fusion technology. And so the things we learned here were things like how to design uh, and fabricate superconducting uh, conductors, you know, how to do high flux cryogenic cooling, um, and all the infrastructure that was left behind at MIT to do this uh, type of work. And so again, to, to make a touch point with TFMC, when we started the program in 2017, we just happened to have a whole bunch of heavy equipment lying around uh, that would let us build, you know, full scale jacketed superconducting cables. And so you can see a picture, this is Rui Vieira and Pete Stahl, you know, people who knew how to work with this equipment and had experience um, that resulted in, you know, very quick R&D uh, that was quite successful on developing a new type of cable. Um, and, you know, a group of people uh, and techniques that allowed us to wind those things um, into coils. So, you know, really this effort sort of, you know, another sort of platform that TFMC could stand on. Um, those cables were then used uh, by many around the world, but also by people at MIT. Uh, one example is the project we looked at earlier. So this is the Eater Central Solenoid Model Coil. Um, MIT was responsible for building half of this coil and then supervising uh, the integration of that coil into the test facility. You know, this occurred in the late 90s to the early 2000s and involved a lot of people um, from the PSFC who then went on to participate in TFMC. Um, so you can see some examples of things that we did. So MIT established a, a, a fabrication facility uh, down in Hingham. Uh, you can see a lot of big tents. You can see small people here that this give you a sense of the scale uh, of what had to be done in a very clean facility. So there were a lot of large scale and complex activities um, that the engineers and technicians uh, had to work out. And then, of course, you know, the, the model coil uh, module uh, that built had to be integrated into the larger test facility. So MIT had people uh, on site to do that. So the real lessons that, that were, you know, sort of developed here for TFMC were establishing fabrication facilities, designing and building complex magnets, um, and integrating those things with test facilities. And so, you know, I really like this picture um, because it's not an accident that the CSMC model coil on the left 20 years ago and the TFMC uh, on the right look so similar and that they worked on the first attempt. Um, so, you know, it was really our participation uh, and, you know, people came before me um, in the CSMC who enabled the experience and the expertise to put these magnets together, but also to seamlessly integrate them into what are, you know, inevitably very complex uh, test facilities. So really a direct, uh, really a direct connection uh, of, of what we did then uh, with what we did on TFMC. So I want to, oh no, my slides got uh, a little messed up here, unfortunately. So uh, I'll carry you through this, even though there's something in the way. Um, so the next step uh, that I want to follow was the development of a new type of superconducting cable. So the CIC cable we just looked at was an older style of superconductor. Now we want to carry uh, this forward to, to develop Rebco uh, cables. And so, the idea here, uh, which was led by Makoto Takayasu at MIT, was to take many, many small flat tapes and to combine them together in such a way that they could carry the very large currents 
to be cooled uh, and to do other things uh, that we needed uh, for fusion. And so Makoto, you know, really deserves an enormous amount of credit because while a lot of us here at MIT were, you know, doing plasma physics and looking at other things, uh, Makoto was actually developing the first conductors uh, out of this new type of superconductor that were suitable for fusion. Unfortunately, all those pictures are hidden behind uh, hidden behind this uh, slide. Makoto did uh, things like joints. He developed cables. Uh, he developed, uh, you can see here on the right, uh, some of the first coils and proved that they could work at very high conditions uh, you know, without any degradation. And so there was a lot of takeaways for TFMC, you know, the basic technology, you know, how to build these style of Rebco cables, um, what the joints might look like, how to bend them, uh, et cetera. And of course, I think it's important to, to point out that Makoto's work is, is now made impacts all around the world. So, you know, there are many types of, of this conductor technology which are being developed, and they're all based on this T-STAT concept uh, that came out of MIT. For TFMC, you know, it was really good that we had that T-STAC um, work being done, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years because it enabled something that was necessary to test the coil. And so you can see here on the top left, these are superconducting Rebco cables that we developed, similar to Makoto's cables and using a lot of his learning. We call them Viper cables. Um, you know, this was a technology we were able to move on very quickly. And so we developed these in the first years of the project. These are now sort of the foundation uh, for some of the other magnets that are being developed uh, for Spark. But they also provided what we call a cold bus, uh, which is essentially a way to trans, you know, get 50 kiloamps of current uh, from this component in the test hall uh, called the current leads all the way over to the magnet, which is sitting here uh, on the right in this picture. So you have to have a way to get current from one place to another. Um, and in this case, there were really no alternatives out there. And so it was really nice that we had developed this technology. You can see a picture uh, of what those cold bus cables look like here uh, and sort of a picture of them you know, being installed. All comes from the T-Stack uh, concept. So I realized once again, uh, I've managed to, to fudge my slides uh, and I put a slide on top of another, which is very unfortunate. Um, so it goes. Um, so what I want to talk about next is another uh, concept that came out of MIT, uh, this case from uh, Yuki Iwasa's group in the, the Francis Bitter Magnet Laboratory. And this was the idea that Remco coils could be built with no insulation, no electrical insulation. And this was a pretty radical idea um, at the time. This is a completely new way to build a magnet uh, and to operate it uh, to achieve high field. So th these were ideas that were developed by people like Sun Yun Han, uh, Dong Kun Park, who's pictured here behind this magnet. Sorry, Dong Kun, um, Yuki Iwasa, Jan uh, Juan Biscannon, and, uh, and others. Um, and they basically built the first coils in late 2009 and 2010. Uh, and ran them through a number of tests. And they sort of proved out the, the fundamental physics and engineering of these coils. Uh, and these coils had a number of advantages. So for example, they could carry a lot of current in a small space. That means the magnet could be very compact, but it can be very high field. Um, they did a lot of the uh, early physics, of how a no insulation coil would work, how electrical currents would move uh, around in these magnets. Um, they also you know, did something which I think is important. You can kind of still see it here. It's a little obscured, um, is they sort of reignite this race to, to high magnetic field. So you can see uh, year here on the X axis. Uh, Tesla is here on the, the X, Y axis, excuse me. And you see a number of coils that MIT built were really the first uh, in a series of other groups starting to take this technology and push the limits um, up to uh, where it stands now, which is Sun Yun Han's coil in Korea. Uh, which is an all Rebco NI coil of about 46 Tesla. Um, and so I wanted to make the, the same point as I did for, for Makoto um, that you know, Yuki and Don Kuhn and Sun Yan's you know, work here at MIT has now had impact far beyond MIT. So we have groups at CERN, uh, National High Field Lab doing really innovative things with NI coils and other groups in fusion, uh, Tokamak Energy in England, Seoul National University where Sun Yung Han now is um, developing this NI technology um, with a look towards fusion magnets, very similar to what we're doing here. And so, you know, for TFMC, again, this was an amazing foundation for us because that first uh, coil that was developed in 2009, uh, about six years later, the seeds of what would become the TFMC team came along 
uh, and wound our own single tape Rebco coil uh, with some assistance from Yuki's group. So we were sort of just getting our feet wet and, and learning how to do some of these things. Um, and that led directly then in 2018 for us to make a number of changes and innovations to this technology to make the magnets suitable for fusion, large scale fusion magnets. So, you know, it was really helpful. So when, you know, see a picture uh, Bill Beck and Brian LaBombard wound the first NIN coil um, and when we were looking at the first uh, post soldered NIN coil, um, you know, we did so with an idea there was a lot of confidence um, and understanding of how these coils went um, that really helped us uh, make the innovations necessary for our own magnet designs. So as we're sort of coming into the more modern era, I want to end with sort of two, uh, two things. Um, the first is not necessarily a project, it's actually an academic course. So this is a, a class, a graduate class that's taught by Dennis White. In this case, it was taught in the spring of 2010. Uh, a number of us participated uh, in this course that went on to have key roles in Spark and, and uh, you know, the TFMC. Um, but what this class resulted in was a paper that published the first proposed design of a toroidal field magnet coil with Rebco. Um, and you can see some pictures of the magnets and some cross section of the magnets here. And while I can say, you know, looking back, at, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, not, you know, uh, well, um, you know, well-intentioned naivety in it. Um, you know, this was really the first time, you know, a group had sat down, I think, and thought really seriously what a modern Rebco coil would look like. Um, and so that was really a benefit. So the benefit for us on TFMC was that, you know, we knew what high field fusion could do in terms of device, you know, fusion device performance, size, cost. We had a, a good working knowledge of what some of the challenges might be with building Rebco toroidal field magnets um, and what Rebco was and, and how to think about it. And maybe importantly, you know, sort of a group of highly enthusiastic, dare I say, zealous students, you know, who in 2010 were really eager to see this um, brought to the world. And I pulled a quote out from the paper, which I think is relevant uh, from the conclusion, which says, unlike LTS, the previous generation of superconductors, Rebco makes it conceivable to build a reactor with a magnetic field on the order of 20 Tesla to exploit the magnetic field to the fourth dependence of fusion power in a DT burning tokamak reactor. So that is Spark essentially, and it's ARC, and it's the other types of high field fusion devices uh, that are being proposed. Uh, and you can find a lot of it there. I do want to make a, a sort of funny anecdote, uh, which is if you look at this plot on the right, this was sort of a, a system study that was done by myself and Bob Mumgard um, and a few others. Um, and what it what it did was it you sort of put a whole bunch of things, cost and operations and everything else um, into this magnet design and tried to pick what the optimum operating temperature was for this new generation uh, of magnets. And you know nobody had really thought, I think, in, in a great detail perhaps about exactly what temperature might be the right one for a fusion magnet. Um, and it turns out you can see in the black line, you know, the, the, there's a nice sweet spot sort of between 10 and, you know, 20 K. Um, and we always sort of joke amongst ourselves, every other fusion magnet that's been proposed with this always says 20 Kelvin, you know, 20 Kelvin. And it would be sort of amusing uh, if this was sort of the, the nexus of where that idea, uh, where that genesis of where this idea came from. A bunch of students uh, sort of you know, putting things together for a course. Um, the last thing I want to mention, again, not a project or class, but an organization, and it goes to the institutional capabilities at MIT we're able to tap into, and that's a lab, MIT Bates, so the Bates Research and Engineering Center, formerly uh, operated a large linear accelerator uh, up in Middleton, Massachusetts, um, and so, you know, there, in some ways I sort of think of Bates as our sister lab at MIT, you know, a lab of working on you know, large scale complex technology projects. And so um, some people, and I list them here, uh, you know, came onto the TFMC team um, in 2019 uh, to sort of augment our capabilities uh, very quickly. Um, and so you know, that translated uh, into a really, I think, advantageous situation for TFMC because a lot of things uh, could be done very quickly. Uh, and so when we look at the, for instance, the TFMC test hall, which we'll, we'll go into more detail in a second, um, we see a lot of things that come from all of the experience at Bates um, in operating, uh, you know, building and operating very large scale equipment. So to give just, you know, two examples, you know, a power supply uh, that powered uh, a detector that was doing some nuclear physics, you know, we had the experience and the, the vendor connections to very quickly turn that into a 50 kilowatt power supply. Um, you know, similarly for a large detector uh, that was built and operated at Bates, we could import, you know, high power electric bus cables 
and boom, drop them into the, the TFMC uh, to allow us to go quickly. So, you know, that huge base of knowledge that we can tap into um, and the people who came along with it that were really uh, helpful and really helped augment our ability uh, to go as quickly as we wanted to do on TFMC. Um, so I, I sort of want to end our high field odyssey here. Um, and it occurred to me as I was, you know, putting this talk together, uh, my grandmother used to tell me I was, I was always somebody who tried to put 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. Um, and that's clearly what I'm trying to do here by going through the history of high field fusion magnets uh, at MIT. There's so much that we didn't cover uh, and people sent me a lot of details about um, that, that is in that hundred year history. I just want to mention some of those things, you know, everything from test facilities to metallurgical alloy development, high field cyclotrons, motor generators, you know, maglev trains. Um, there's just a lot of uh, projects and experience that were done here um, that, you know, deserve, des deserve time that we just don't have to give them. Um, you know, an example, you know, just to, you know, point it out, a levitated dipole experiment was a project here where we had a two-ton superconducting coil. It was levitated in the middle of a vacuum chamber with other magnets uh, to confine a plasma, very advanced uh, sort of a, um, bold approach to doing plasma confinement. Um, you know, and a fun fact, it turns out one of the magnets that was there was the first ever high temperature superconductor magnet anywhere in the fusion industry. So that came out of MIT. Um, another one, which is one of my favorites that I hadn't come across before was the so-called baby magnet, which was built by Bruce Montgomery, uh, Makoto Takayasu and others at MIT. And the idea here was to actually um, assist in treatment uh, for babies uh, to help them connect esophagus uh, when it was not properly grown uh, in the womb. So this is a particular type of treatment uh, where using little magnetic bullets in a magnetic field, you could actually help surgeons elongate the esophagus uh, and make a surgical connection. So I think that is uh, maybe by far the most unique magnet I've seen come out of PSFC and certainly again testifies to the, the confidence that we have uh, at MIT in building um, pretty novel magnets. So now we sort of enter uh, the last part of our talk. We've been going for about 45 minutes and you know, we have about 10 minutes to go um, and then I'll wrap up. So I wanna talk about now the TFMC project with all of that history um, and sort of knowledge behind us of what went into it. Um, so let's talk about the TFMC. So, you know, we had a lot to do on the TFMC. We looked at the four components of what the project would be, you know, doing the conductor development, building the coil, building the test facility and running the test. All that was really done with the idea of retiring the risk in the production and operation of large scale steady state Rebco magnets. So there's a number of things we had to do. We knew this magnet technology uh, needed to be done such that it could go immediately into Spark, into a high field tokamak. And that really constrained uh, and sort of set the, the tone for what we had to do. So as an example, we had to you know, design it properly. It had to achieve the same requirements that it would see in Spark or close. You know, we had to develop the EM modeling tools uh, to design the Spark magnets. In terms of supply chain, we knew we had to grow the Rebco manufacturers um, to provide us with enough material. Uh, we had to develop structural materials, you know, have, get large scale vendors to participate with us. In terms of fabrication, we wanted tooling, manufacturing processes, process control, scalability um, as a fundamental part of TFMC. We would have to tackle the challenges of high field operation. So structural loading, stress and strain on the superconductors that can damage them. Um, and it wasn't, as I say, just about building a coil. We actually had to develop a whole bunch of novel things that enabled us to test this coil uh, successfully on a very tight timeline. Uh, and ultimately we had to deal with something called quench. So that's the idea that magnets have a lot of stored energy, superconducting magnets. When they're cold, life is good. But if something goes wrong, all that energy uh, can go into heating the coils up, which can lead to damage. Um, there are other aspects like having high pressure coolant induced eddy forces uh, that create challenges that had to be dealt with. So this is sort of the, you know, the, the, the glamour shot uh, of, the, of the TFMC. So it is the largest Rebco magnet uh, ever built, uh, typically depending on how you look at it by an order of magnitude or a few. Uh, so you can see an example of the size of the magnet. It's about three meters uh, by two meters. It's D-shaped. Uh, both to allow high concentration of the magnetic field in the corners to get up to that 20 Tesla margin. Um, but it's also D-shaped to help us prove out sort of the magnetic field um, topology, the fabrication techniques with a D-shaped magnet um, amongst other things. 
So, you know, remember back to the, the bitter plates, um, you know, we had 16 plates or pancakes that we stack into a, a sort of the core of the magnet. We'll look at that in a second. Those man, so that magnet has about 270 kilometers uh, of superconductor in it. That's enough to go from here to Albany in one continuous uh, stretch. We operate this magnet at about 20 Kelvin. Again, maybe because a bunch of students uh, 12 years ago thought that was a good idea. Uh, we use supercritical helium at very high pressures, about 20 bar, um, you know, 300, say 50 PSI. The current is about 40 kiloamps. We get in excess of 20 Tesla on axis. And the magnet itself, uh, you know, weighs about 10 kilograms or about 11 uh, imperial tons. So it's, you know, pretty impressive uh, magnet, very much a step change by about a factor of a thousand in terms of mass uh, of the, rev, you know, largest Revco magnet that's ever been built. So a little more details, how do we build this? So you can think of this as really a Revco stack in plate no insulation magnet, kind of putting together a lot of the Revco stack work and the NI work that came uh, earlier from MIT. So what we do is we take a steel plate and we machine grooves in it on one side where we put stacks of Revco cables. On the other side, we have grooves for cooling. Um, those Revco stacks terminate at these so-called uh, internal pancake to pancake joints. So that such that when we stack multiple pancakes, the current has a path to go around in a spiral to generate the magnetic field and then into the next pancake where it can continue to spiral. And then we've developed a, a VPI, vacuum pressure impregnation solder process to bond everything mechanically, electrically and thermally together. So then what do we do? We take all these pancakes, we stack them up uh, into a winding pack, which you can see here. So you can kind of think of that as the core of the magnet. We put two plates top and bottom uh, with these parts you see here called current leads. You, know, you can think of those essentially the, the plus and minus terminals um, of a battery or, or something that uses power. So that's where we hook up our current and inject it into the magnet so that it can create field. And then just like the bitter plate concept you saw earlier, we can take this magnet, put it in a large structural case to deal with the electromechanical forces, but it also serves as a pressure vessel. Where we can force flow cooling, you know, through all the channels in the magnet to make sure that those superconducting um, pancakes stay cold. So why do we want to do it this way? What are the real advantages of the magnet? There's a number of proposed design features and the goal of the TFMC project and other magnet projects will be to prove these design features out. So the first is it's modular, simple construction compared to other generations of magnets. You know, rapid assembly, easy maintenance. You can swap pancakes in and out. Uh, it's very scalable for commercial production. This is intrinsically a low voltage technology. That was one of the uh, early uh, advantages that was proven uh, about NI magnets. So it's less than a volt. That's very different than other uh, fusion superconducting magnets, which have to operate at five or 10 kilovolts, where you can get arcs, you can get lightning bolts uh, and cause, uh, or just cause damage or destroy your magnets. And that's really nice for us. It means minimal insulation, simple fabrication, you know, low voltage systems around the magnet and, and increased safety for people. The magnet has high thermal stability. That means it's very hard for it to stop being superconducting. It's robust to damage or defects that are caused by manufacturing. Um, and off normal events in operation, you know, are recoverable. You know, sits in the bottom of a nice well and you know it likes to be cold. The other idea was this pressure vessel cooling approach. While this is you know standard for bitter plate magnets, it's very different than. Um, you know, the traditional superconducting uh, magnets that exist today. This gives us, you know, enhanced heat removal, the ability to optimize locally where we want to cool, you know, very simple manifolding to get the, the supercritical helium in and out. The magnet has very high, you know, current in a small space. You know, that gives us a compact magnet and it lets us take some of the space uh, that would be needed with other technologies and put it to other uses. Uh, and then, you know, another proposal is that this magnet, like the smaller NI magnets that have been built, are essentially passively safe to a quench event, meaning that if the magnet were to quench and warm up, uh, the magnet would be, uh, you know, just fine. It doesn't require a whole bunch of infrastructure uh, to actually protect it. And so all of these are sort of proposals uh, to be proven out in the TFMC project um, and in others. So that's the magnet. What about the test facility? So the test facility was built at MIT in about 18 months. You see a pretty impressive uh, time lapse here where we took the cell uh, that was outside of Alcator. So this is about a 10,000 square foot hall. It was filled to the brim uh, with equipment, basically cleaned that out over the span of nine months. And then nine months later had built, uh, assembled and commissioned 
uh, the test facility that we needed for the TFMC, but also for other uh, future magnet projects. So a very, very quick turnaround showing uh, what the team uh, achieved in a, in a short time. Now it's a very unique and capable test facility. So just to point out a few things that you see in this picture, we have a 50 kiloamp power supply over here. We have a 50 kiloamp warm bus that brings our current down to this large vacuum vessel here. Inside we have something called the current leads whose job it is is to take this you know, very large electrical current from room temperature at the top down to cryogenic temperatures, in this case, 20 Kelvin at the bottom, and then a series of cables to bring that current uh, into the toroidal field model coil, uh, which sits in this large uh, vacuum vessel here. So we have you know, all the support systems that we need, you know, a cryo system that's liquid free, we have a large crane, you know, we have a whole bunch of other systems you see here at the bottom that are required um, to operate you know, what is really a, a full scale and complex test facility. Now of all the innovations we, we had to do to make the magnet test possible, I just want to, I have time and I want to focus on one, um, which is what we call the 50 kiloamp binary Rebco current leads and feeder system. So this is, you know, essentially another uh, major innovation where uh, I think these are the largest uh, current leads of their kind by a factor of two to three uh, than have ever been built. And so, you know, these were largely designed, uh, assembled and commissioned in house. Uh, because there were simply no other alternatives out there uh, that could be developed and delivered on the schedule that we needed. Uh, and the idea being, you know, the current comes in at the top, uh, it comes down to a 77K stage, and then is brought down uh, to 20 Kelvin. So it's cooled by liquid nitrogen in the middle and supercritical helium at the bottom. And then the idea being that uh, that series of Viper cable that we saw before can carry that current, uh, you know, on the positive terminal can carry that current through a series of cables into the magnet, which is down here on the right, and then return uh, at the negative terminal uh, back to the power supply. So these were, you know, sort of an entire project in and of themselves, uh, and they were tested quite successfully to 41 kiloamps before the test, uh, you know, with all joints, you know, meeting our specification uh, by a factor of a few. So a, a really nice series of innovations. So I want to wrap up here with the, the first test. The job here was to assess the steady state operation at full performance uh, of the coil. And we really asked three questions. Does the peak field on coil exceed 20 Tesla? That was a key metric for us. Does the magnetic field and the power dissipation, the heating within this magnet, um, match these very detailed uh, models uh, that a team of uh, people uh, developed to predict the behavior of current and heat and field in this sort of new type of no insulation magnet? Uh, where those things were you know, not as well known before we did the test. You can see a picture uh, of what the field distribution looks like from one of the models, where we have very high fields in the corner. And in fact, if you look at these black rectangles, these are the winding pack. This is where the actual superconductor is uh, in the magnet. You can see over a large portion of the coil, uh, we get fields in excess of 20 Tesla, very high electromechanical forces um, you know, right here, which was one of the, the design objectives. And so this windy pack had an array of extensive instrumentation um, to measure you know, just about everything we wanted to see. Um, and of course, our, our modeling team and the physicists worked with the operations team to develop uh, a test program. This is a prediction of that program, where over the span of about four days, uh, we ramp up the coil and steps to get to our you know, peak performance objective. And so I'm very happy to, to report, as you know, many of you probably know already and, and saw in articles, but this test in early, late August, early September was, was very successful, uh, largely went according uh, to the plan. So you can see here, we ramped up the current uh, over the span of about 60 hours, uh, pausing in steps to look at the physics of the magnet um, and tracking the magnetic field that we got. You can see um, you know, a significant fraction uh, exceeded 20 Tesla on the magnet. And so that was mission achieved uh, for the whole team, uh, a big moment of relief. And then the magnet was ramped down. I'm not going to go into all the details. I leave them here uh, for people who want to go over them. But, you know, I, I think the point to be made here that a number of things were achieved in the test. You know, this high field 20 Tesla performance in a large scale magnet was confirmed. Um, we had very low resistance interpancake joints, which is joints are always a big risk to a superconducting coil. If they're not made properly, the coil heats up and doesn't work. Uh, we had very good cryogenic performance, the ability to control and maintain temperatures in the magnet. 
to significant structural loading on the magnet, you know, in some cases almost approaching a gigapascal uh, was handled as designed by the winding pack in that big structural case. And we had very good match uh, to the simulated predictions of how this coil would operate um, in steady state. So a lot of uh, nice science and engineering objectives were achieved. So I want to close here um, and, you know, just sort of make the point that while we've kind of been looking, you know, at a lot of individual projects, um, sort of gateposts along the journey, if you like. I think the graphic on the left kind of illustrates, for me, one of the points I wanted to make here was not the individual gateposts, but really this sort of long line that connects what we were able to do on the TFMC all the way back to Francis Bitter in 1935. It really is a continuity uh, of things that happened here that enabled the success. And I think, uh, you know, for me, it was a really interesting, you know, opportunity to sort of go back and look at the history and, and you know, hopefully recognize, you know, the people and the projects that, you know, came before us. So, you know, here, I think just to, to make our, our final points, high field superconducting magnets, you know, we think will generate a faster lower cost path diffusion. Uh, it was really the 85 years of culture and institutional capabilities and, and really the people um, who were involved uh, in these previous projects in TFMC who helped those of us who came later, um, you know, to make our own contributions uh, and be successful. And with the test of the TFMC uh, successful at 20 Tesla, it really ushers in a new era of high field superconducting magnets at unprecedented scale and performance. And so the next, let's say five to 10 years uh, should be a pretty exciting time uh, to see where things go, both in high field magnets, but also in fusion energy. So I'll stop there. Thank you everybody uh, for attending.